We're off to the Green Hill Zone with Sonic the Hedgehog. We meet a new Emma and we're dealing with the public. I'm Van Connor. And I'm Bex Perfect. And this is Off Screen, your seven day guide to everything movies. Boom. Groovy. Ah, oh, Van. Bex. It's movie week again. It is. It's always movie week for yeah. us, isn't it? We, do we ever get a week off? I don't think we do, do we? No. Well, we might do <laughs> holiday times. You might have to get a little guest in every now and again. Every now and again. And I'll we'll find you. someone. We'll find someone. <laughs> but you know what? We've had an interesting week last week. You know, a Harley Quinn movie that came out. They've had to change the marketing on that one. Didn't they change the title? They changed the title because people didn't get it. Yeah, it's like Harley Quinn colon Birds of Prey. Yes. Yeah. Because it has a bit of a soft opening. So interesting on that. It has not opened to the best, uh, you know, box office takings, mm. which interesting with Margot Robbie fronting that. It's and very it was odd, so, isn't yeah, it? it's very, very odd. So this week, we're not talking about that, obviously, because, mm. uh, you know, we're, we're kind of coming out of the back of all of that, plus the post Oscar slum- slumber. I was about to say, we have, we have an extra few minutes. Should we touch on the Oscars really quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we were all taken aback by the brilliance of Parasite. Well, I mean, I think we were more taken about the just for once, the right film. One? Yes, 100%. How, how cynical does that make us? Literally everyone in our industry just went, Parasite should win, 1917 will win, and then we were all proven wrong. Yeah, and do you know yeah. what? We, when we were doing this on, when we were doing the overnight broadcast on Talk Sport and also Talk Radio, I actually said that we should have slapped ourselves on the wrist because, you know, <laughs> shame on us. We should have seen this one coming because 1917 swept up at the BAFTAs. Mm. And that's often an indicator because it's a British film. Yeah. And, you know, that us Brits, we love it. We're like, everyone must love it. But actually... Well, I think that's it. I think we were just being cynical. That's yeah. what it was. We were all... To be fair, in any other year... Yeah, possibly. In any other year, it probably would have gone the other way. It's what do you think serene. diversity was a big kind of... Yeah. Just drove the... Well, I don't know. You know, it drove we, the... We said on the night, didn't we, that Parasite was more or less single-handedly carrying what was the diversity card for the yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, So that it won, I suppose, may have been a, a sort of a reaction to the, the wave of negativity surrounding the ceremony. So, yeah, surrounding the nominations, yeah. I suppose, because I'm wondering like, at what point your votes actually get cast. Uh, the week of... The week it, it off, the week so off. they would have seen the, all of that kind of mm, backlash and then suddenly... They will have seen it. I yeah, think the deadline is the Thursday. I okay. think it's the Thursday. It's only about two or three days before the actual ceremony. Wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of counting for people I, to I do. I thought it was wider, but I'd imagine it's got to be all digital, for sure. Maybe, I maybe. Mean, do, you, do you get to vote in any film awards? Uh, no, because I don't pay the membership fees. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm uh, online film critics site. I vote in every year. I vote yeah. in their awards because uh, I would forget, and then Matt Turner has to text me and remind me oh, every year, like clockwork. I did it from a bar this year. It's nice to know that you're taking your responsibility seriously. I do. I'm very committed yeah. to my craft. Um, but you know, I, I was in a bar and I was just like Florence Pugh, Florence Pugh, Florence Pugh, and that was basically yeah. But uh, yeah, but I you know what? I, I saw Parasite. I went to. Oh, I paid to go. You paid? I paid. Like on a, a, like I went a person. To, yes, like a real person. I went to the Ritzy in Brixton on the Saturday. Had some time to myself. Don't, don't, don't judge me. Yeah. And uh, me and I think eight others were watching Parasite. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure those cinemas will be more than full. Oh, it's, it's got a wider release on like the morning yeah. after the week. But I loved it, and I love. I, I agreed with everything that you said, to having talked about it last week. And I think it was absolutely the worthy winner. Mm. Oh, definitely. I think so. So uh, we've got five minutes. Are you going to tell me all about a video game adaptation? of one of my childhood favourites. Yeah. Please, Miss Perfect, tell me about Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, it is a shame that it just missed the Oscars. Is it? I mean, yeah, uh, no, I'm Best lying. Out to I'm Jim absolutely Green? lying in uh, this. I know. Sorry to burst your bubble on this. So, look, a blue hedgehog. We all love a good blue hedgehog. We've all played the game. We all love the sound of the rings, the ding. That they do. I love all of that. And I love the world, the green zones, you know, whatever yeah. zones. Green Hill Zone. Green Hill Zone, that's yeah. it. Um, so most of us have probably played this game at some point and having it on the big screen is probably highly anticipated. Am I right? Quite, yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, so in this movie, we discover that our super speedy friend on Earth uh, is it, well, he's here on Earth now. And he tries to navigate his life whilst not being discovered. He's in hiding. Then, he's in so, hiding yeah. on Earth. Yeah. But, but is ha- this because he, he, there are outside forces who want to steal his speed? Is that the thing? There's Dr. Robotnik. Ah, okay. Yes. Or you call him Dr. Egghead, don't you? Eggman. No, 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 I don't. I'm Robotnik. This is a litmus test with people. Do you call him Robotnik or Eggman? Yeah, Robotnik. See, I remember reading the original comics when his name was Dr. Kinterbor, uh, which is actually Robotnik in reverse, and then he becomes Robotnik later on. So, yeah. I like that. that. Anyway, he's trying to capture him, basically, and trying to use his powers for world domination. So, Sonic basically goes on essentially a road trip movie um, with uh, James Marsden, who plays a small town cop, and they have this like bromance trying to get to San Francisco to kind of recoup his rings. I'm wet. 
I'm cold, there's a fish on my head, and clearly I'm not gonna be able to do this on my own. All right, get in the truck. Really? You're gonna help me? I guess it is a little bit my fault that all this is happening to you. Not a little bit, entirely. It is entirely your okay, fault. It's entirely my fault. Are you coming? Yes. Road trip! Whoop, whoop! What am I doing? So that's James Marsden, I believe. That's Cyclops, isn't it? The Cyclops, Cyclops from the Cyclops earlier X Men movie. Yeah, and Sonic is Ben Schwartz from House of Lies and Parks and yeah. Recreation, who I like very much. Who the voice actually really works, because you need that kind I, of like. I that, yeah. yeah, like the teenager, like mm. too much energy, quite annoying, but um, still somewhat endearing at the same time. It kind of works with he all of that. It does seem to be played as a sort of halfway point between the Flash and the Tasmanian Devil. Yeah. yeah, it does seem to be sort of high, high, halfway. And all, all I'm going to say is, thank God they took it back and redesigned the character of Sonic after that trailer. I like the the redesign, although I will say, I think a lot of the backlash on that was down to the fact that the first one was just a terrible trailer, and the second one actually is just a better trailer. You say yeah. it's just a better trailer. Mm. That trailer gives you everything of the movie. Really now? Yeah, huh. and actually, I think I preferred the trailer to the movie. Um, this is the thing: is that it's so. So, for anyone who doesn't know or hasn't seen the trailer, it's a CGI in a live action environment. Yeah. CGI hedgehog in a live action environment. So, it's interesting. If you're wondering what that is, think Roger Rabbit, but <laughs> like more advanced. Well, funnily enough, because it starred James Marsden, Ted? there's a very obvious yeah, Ted. Ted? But there's, there's a more even more obvious comparison, okay. specifically because of James Marsden, Hop. Uh, the Easter Bunny movie starring okay. James Marsden, where they literally did this with Russell Brand as the Easter Bunny, as a CG Easter Bunny. And the weirdest thing is, I can't fathom, who decided to take a property involving a, you know, super speed endowed hedgehog and make a road trip movie out of it? But who, also, whose mind does that? Whose mind was it to think of the fans would want you to take it out of <laughs> exactly. the actual zone that he's in? Because we do see it at the beginning, hmm. right? And we see his world. And I'm like, wow, if we watch a movie that's set in this world, it's going to be so much fun. But I, you set it in, in essentially a really boring town in yeah. America on its way, and then en route to San Francisco, which you only really see at the end. It doesn't work. That's called the Spurs problem. If you I have... call this your problem that you've seen too many of these bad animated movies. Well, you know, because I, I, I love 80s, 80s, 90s yeah, cartoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the thing with the Smurfs was you had a movie about the Smurfs and what they did, you know, was simply put them in the human world. I'm like, I don't want to see that. I want to see the Smurfs in the Smurf world. And to yeah. be fair, they did do that with one of the sequels. Good. Which, and it was a lot better as well. Yeah. It's the best one of them. But uh, here's a question. Did you sit through the, uh, the totality of the end credits? Absolutely not. I got out there as quickly as I possibly could. You did not. No. Oh, okay, because I think that's going to be a required thing for this film. There is, uh, well, there are several forms of setup for Well, uh, there involved. is a bit of a setup mm. that I did see, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, and it kind of made sense. So, I mean, whether or not that sets up for another movie, I'm not sure it's going to take the box office numbers to warrant a second movie. I don't know. It's Sonic the Hedgehog. That brand is huge, yeah. especially less so in the UK, I think, now. He was an icon of the 90s, admittedly, but I think Sonic is still, like, galactically huge, particularly in Asia. It just, yeah, and, and I, that's why I think there's going to be a huge disappointment, because mm. what this is is essentially a kid's movie that doesn't appeal to adults. You think? And that's the problem, is that a good kid's movie has the adult stuff in it. There yeah. was not one laugh in this screening of it and that's not reflective of us that is just the situation of the state of play yeah. the good thing about the positives that I will pull out of it I love seeing Jim Carrey be Jim Carrey on stage on, on film full 90s maniac mode almost but I felt restricted just ever so slightly with him but he is the right person to play Dr. Robotnik and that worked for me and again, yeah, for me, it just felt flat. And that's the biggest problem with this. It should have been speedy. It should have been out there. It should have been throwing from world to world to world so we can see all of that. And we're not. We're just in boring older. I love that you call it flat and when we're talking about something that's taken a two-dimensional video game and brought it into 3D reality. Well, isn't that even worse? That's the, the irony of it all. How many blue spikes are you putting up for it then? Half. Half? Half a blue spike? Half a blue spike. Okay. Didn't enough. like it. Game over, man. Yeah. And we're back, and hopefully we can cheer things up a little bit for I hope us. so. I'm feeling quite depressed well, right now. I think we both like our next offering for this week, which is, oh, of course, yes. uh, the new adaptation of Jane Austen's uh, Emma. Yes. Yeah. I learned a lot through this, actually, because I've never read the book, mm -hmm. and I'd never seen the Gwyneth Paltrow 1996 How version. How do you not? I'm no. surprised by that. But I have grown up watching Clueless. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right. is this the, so this is the first version of Emma you've encountered directly? Then? Yes. Right. So and this co- was a revelation, given my love for Clueless. I was going to say, were you caught off guard by just so how much guard. of Clueless is taken from this yes. book? Yes. So I, I loved it. Maybe never watch The Taming of the Shrew. Okay. Just, just a thought, because you're just going to think this is 10 things I hate about you all over again. Oh, no, I knew that. <laughs> yeah, I know. But there's a whole bunch of these, isn't it? Like, She's the Man yeah. is uh, yeah. uh, the Twelfth Night? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. So, okay, the new adaptation from uh, Autumn to Wild uh, stars Anya Taylor Joy as Emma, stars uh, Johnny Flynn. Musician Johnny Flynn. Is that what we call him? Musician Johnny Flynn now? Yes. Okay. I know he okay. was in Beast, but uh, yeah. Go on. Oh, I don't know. Cause I, I, I just because obviously I know he's going to play David Bowie next. Yes, I know. And I'm, I'm really excited. Musician. About... <laughs> well, exactly. But I didn't know he was an actual musician. Yes, it's like uh, his, his, his band is called like something like Johnny Flynn and the Sussex Wits. <laughs> Sussex Wits or oh, something. Fair enough. So uh, I'll Johnny Flynn that. is uh, Mr. <laughs> Knightley. We have Josh O'Connor as Mr. Elton. Uh, Gemma Wheeler from Game of Thrones turns up as uh, Mrs. Weston. You've got uh, uh, you've Bill got couple, Nye. You've got Bill Nye. You've got Miranda Hart. And you've also got a couple of members from Sex Education in this as well. You, you have, strangely, yes. as well. And it is, of course, an adaptation of the timeless tale of Emma Wood... Was it, is she Lady Emma Woodhouse? Uh, Miss uh, Emma Woodhouse? Miss, I think they Miss call Miss Emma Woodhouse. And her, uh, her sort of... Her dabbling in the fine art of effectively fixing people up. Turns out she can mend anyone's broken heart. She can pair any two lost souls. She just can't find love for herself. You must have had a shocking walk. Not at all, sir. It's a beautiful evening. You must have found it very damp and dirty. Dirty, sir. <laughs> Look at my shoes. Not a speck on them. How do you do? I came to wish you joy. Joy? Oh, the wedding. It's a terrible day. <laughs> so how did you all behave? Who cried the most? We all behaved charmingly. Everybody was in their best looks. Not a tear and hardly a long face to be seen. Bring the screen a little closer, Mr. Knightley feels a chill. I don't think it's a case of her not finding love. She just doesn't want it. She's not interested. That's no, the thing, she's not it? interested yeah. in that. And, you know, and that's mm. where you realise that she's Cher from, from Clueless. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that is the moment. Right. When she's... <laughs> what did you think of her? Go on. What do you think of Anya? I am not a massive fan of period dramas because no. I, I think the, the trick to a good period drama or a period film is that people who love the books mm-hmm. must love the film. But people who are new to the story yeah. must get it and enjoy it. So the opposite of the cat's problem, then? Yes. Yeah. 100%. Okay. And I think this does this really well. So uh, good examples of that, Sense of Sensibility, Pride and mm-hmm. Prejudice. You know, those films do that really well. This film brought it yeah. in that respect as well. There's a, a contemporary edge to this, yes. I think. In a way, there's, a, it, there's something in the performances that makes everything so naturalistic in a sort of in a contemporary way. Something about the the close-ups on Anya mm. Taylor-Joy's expressions yes. is what makes it work. There's an almost flea-baggy quality a to her bit, in a strange A little bit of breaking the fourth wall. Mm. Almost breaking almost, the fourth wall. Almost, yeah. Almost, yeah. yeah. not quite. It's very knowing. Yeah, yeah. it is really knowing. And do you know what? I think it's, it's, it's accomplished. The, the director very much said she wanted to use an up-and-coming cast mm. and, you know, people to keep an eye on and see. I thought Johnny Flynn was brilliant in I this. Good you as know, because well, yeah. he has to be a little bit rugged and mm. he has to be, but there has to be something. I mean, you guessed it from the beginning that they'll end oh, up to, of course you together. Do. You yeah, know that yeah. that's going to be the story because it's such a brother sister t- type, like push and pull between them. Mm. But also, I think what really works is that he is very underplayed. He is indeed. Um, I, I, I'd like the, there's a sort of a duality to the character as well, in that it's Johnny Flynn, so there's a certain ruggedness to him. Yeah. There's a certain rough. Do you and know much quality. about him before? Uh, no, no. I only know him from Beast and like, yeah. literally any any. What was the other film I saw him in? I thought he was quite good in. But it was adorable. But uh, I, there's a rugged quality to it. But at the same time, the character has a slight of a poser's edge to him as well. There's a, mm. a comment in our clip about, oh, my shoes are spotless. You know, yeah. not, not a mark on them. Like, I've I, walked all the way. Yeah, yeah no I mud. like that duality. I think that's really good. Yeah, I think that definitely works in it. And I think I like the fact that a lot of people mm. will know who Anya Taylor-Joy are, but not everyone knows who she is. Right? She had a brilliant turn in The Witch. We've seen her in mm. Peaky Blinders of late as well. And Split as well uh, yeah. Split and Glass she's got, the, got that new X-Men movie coming out New Mutants okay so then well. maybe she'll step mm. up into a more commercially known role however 
I can only imagine yeah. in the 1996 version of Emma, Gwyneth Paltrow is quite distracting. Well, Gwyneth Paltrow wasn't Gwyneth Paltrow back then. She wasn't a known quantity. Right. Uh, it was one of the first one of the first roles for Tony Collette as well, uh -huh. having just broken out with Muriel's Wedding. So they weren't really stars. I mean, Jeremy, Nor Jeremy Northam was uh, Mr. Knightley in that. Jeremy Northam was, wasn't really a big heartthrob either. Mm. It was a cast of it was what it was a lower rung cast than you would have found on a BBC TV adaptation. Yeah. To be fair, um, I think the film is very good. I think Bill Nye steals it. I think oh. Miranda Hart steals it. The moment Bill Nye jumps from the mm. stairs into the hallway to walk in for his entrance is hilarious, yeah. and his use of screens to yes. <laughs> he, he, he feels a draft. Yes, he, feels he feels a draft, a draft. coming. Yeah. But Miranda Hart is proving herself to be Quite versatile. Yeah, very yeah. versatile as an actress. Very funny. She picks her moments brilliantly. Mm. She is a real treasure for us for the British acting dynasty. Should I we think say? So. Of how us many, all. <laughs> how many thumbs from you, Miss Perfect? I'm gonna give it a. Uh, one and three quarters. I'm just going two with it. I, yeah. I, had a great, I had a really good time. I mean, I think it's my second favourite romance story anyway. Yeah. Um, but... I, 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 did, I had a great time yeah. I thought it was a really good adaptation I, it looked the part it sounded the part I just had a ball with it no that's good and for me someone who hasn't read the book yeah. didn't realise the clueless connection and <laughs> uh, sat through it thinking oh no not another period movie yes it really is delightful that sounds like a Wayne Brothers parody is it not another not another yeah, period yeah, movie yeah. <laughs> yeah. let's Except, not go there shall we <laughs> I think they would take that title in a different direction uh, <laughs> let's talk then about uh, we've got like two and a half minutes to talk about the public really quickly new movie written and directed by and starring Emilio Estevez oh I know, right? How Where has he been since the 80s? And this week, they have greenlit the reboot series of Mighty Ducks, and he's coming back. I've yes. also, I'm, I'm sad though, because they've also mm. said that they're rebooting The Goonies, and I'm like, just leave that alone. And Rick Moranis is coming back for a oh, sequel yeah, to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and Josh Gad is the son. Oh my God, this is the greatest week ever. So, um, new movie, uh, say The Public, uh, set in a Cincinnati library. Mm -hmm. uh, Emilio Estevez is uh, Mr. Goodman. He is the manager of the, uh, of the library. During a particularly cold storm, yeah. uh, because of the number of local homeless uh, people who, tr you know, typically hang and routinely hang around the library, as you would find in any major major metropolitan public library, um, he basically is sort of initially coerced, but then becomes complicit in allowing a large number of the homeless from the local community who can't fit into overcrowded shelters to stay in the library in circumstances that are then misconstrued as a hostage situation. Rick Jackson. So, use it to get some food, maybe a room. You're gonna offer me money and then tell me what to do with it? Well, well no, I, I was just suggesting a few things that I thought you, you might need, is all. How do you know what I need? For the cause. Evil is the root of all money. Hey, Hell Caesar. Caesar. <laughs> you guys are just encouraging him. And you can see the kind of relationship yeah. that he has with, uh, with with the homeless people there. And it's a it's a wonderful performance from Emilio Estevez in that way that he just always do, he always delivers. You know, in that sort so, of. So yeah. interestingly, you well, said it's a wonderful performance. He's also directed this and written it. Yeah, he has as well. And this is the thing, I, he, he's stepped away from the acting of what about two decades now. Yeah. Realistically, and he's gone more into the directing. And you look at things like Bobby. Did you ever see Bobby no. back in about 15 years? And that was a hell of a cast. Uh, that was all about the night RFK got assassinated. Oh, okay, yep. Uh, really good movie. Had a very early dramatic turn from Zac Efron, I think, in it as well. Right. Good movie worth checking out. He's also done The Way, which was quite good as well. This, I would say, is probably his second strongest film of those three. Just I'm not it. sure if he's done any others, actually. It's got a great cast. It has. So Alec Baldwin, Christian Slater, Jeffrey Wright, Taylor Schilling, Michael K. Williams, uh, Jenna Malone. Gabrielle Union. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. I'm impressed with this cast. How are there any flaws to this movie? Right. So it does have a grand point to make, obviously, as related as relating to you know homelessness in America and yeah. Yeah, you know the toll that is taking at the moment, uh, especially now and especially this time of year and especially during this current administration, let's say. Yeah. Um, the, so it is set in this. It's very day much and age. set okay. now. Yes, it does deal with issues very head on. What I will say though is, at times it's too heavy handed. At right. other times, it soft it soft pedals too much, okay. and you do kind so of it doesn't find the balance. It doesn't seem to find that balance. And you want it at times to just le lessen up on the cheese ball stuff. And there are times when you want it to just go nasty and you know really hammer its points home with some vigour. Yeah. 
it never quite finds the balance, but the wobbling slows down just enough that it becomes vaguely consistent and you can get into it. And it is solid, the cast are good, yeah. the script works, Emilio can shoot the hell out of it, no doubt about that. I have missed the man on screen, I'm, I'm, I can't possibly oh, deny I, it. I know, I just, I thought mm. he was such a great actor. This is the thing, it's like mm. these these whole kind of, we're, we're picking upon things of our youth and our generation of mm. growing up and, and loving all yeah. of this and seeing him come back. It's exactly, like, it's just yeah. so nice. I'm so excited for that Mighty Ducks reboot. But what I will say is I think this will find its highest viewership, I think, three or four months from now when it becomes an unexpected addition to Sky Cinema. Uh, okay. One day when it comes to the premiere for that. I'm quite content. I mean, it's a three-star film. I'm quite content to give it, say, a thumb and a quarter. Yeah. Kind of I can imagine this is only going to be on a slightly limited release as well. I so believe so as well, If yeah. you can't catch it, maybe worth waiting for that sort of Sky Cinema feel in your own home. Absolutely. And in the meanwhile, do check out Bobby because that thing rocks. And now it's time for a segment we like to call Off Screen Pays the Bills. Hey, Bex. Oh, hey, Van. Is it bill time already? <laughs> Ain't nothing going on but the rent. You know that. <laughs> Do you know what, Van? I've been watching um, some old classic movies. In my mind, classic Cl- movies. Classics, eh? Classic comedies. Ooh, I like Yeah, classic. they're, they're shagadelic. Oh, oh, so, oh, I think I know which series you've been watching. I've been watching first to the end of... Austin Powers. What's your favourite? Uh, my favourite is The Spy Who Shagged Me. Oh, interesting. Okay, like yours? that one. Yeah, uh, I've got to say, I like Goldmember. Well, that's funny enough. I'm glad you said that, actually. Oh, yeah? Yes, that's an incredible coincidence. So, uh, our sponsor this week, uh, Acre, a new gold subscription service, effectively, like a, a, a subscription platform for gold. Yes. Okay, so you, you pay like a subscription fee, and uh, and this can be like $50 a month, it can be $30 a month, and it basically small monthly payments that, uh, that then build up and they actually send you gold. Do you know, like branded like bars of billions. gold? Billions. Yeah, exactly like that. I mean, brick of like, gold. Like, should I be turning my house into Fort Knox? <laughs> <laughs> Get that big safe installed. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is the whole thing. So you, you pay like, say, 50 or 30 month, $30 a month. Uh, you, know, you get to you can go online and track like how much money you're topping up, etc. And, and when it's going to pay out. And uh, Basically, once your stash reaches the equivalent of like, I think it's a two and a half gram gold bar, uh, then it sort of just gets delivered to you. It's, oh my so goodness. Cool. I love that idea. In fact, I love gold. D- your love? Gold. <laughs> And I love that movie too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you can find out more by going to uh, getacregold.com forward slash off screen. You can find the link in our show notes as well and start your Acre Gold subscription today. In the meanwhile, so let's talk about uh, other sponsors we have this week. Uh, let's talk about Inner Monkey. Uh, that's my pet name for you. Is, I'm your Inner Monkey. <laughs> You're my Inner Monkey. You're a bad Inner Monkey. <laughs> I'm a bad Inner Monkey. That's fine. I've been called worse. I'm not going to lie. So the Inner Monkey podcast. Okay, I was, I was literally just talking. I was recommending this to a friend downstairs. You know Johnny Seaford, I was recommending it to oh, him downstairs. Yeah. And uh, so this is a new podcast. This is uh, hosted by Daniel Lamb. He's uh, a philosophy graduate based out of uh, Seattle. And uh, the idea here is this is a, a show all about overcoming, uh, you know, your own neuroses, your yeah. irrational impulses. Uh, you know, all the... Rather like me after we record this show. It is. And yep. you just... Okay, is that when you usually think like, oh my god, I gotta go home, I gotta, I gotta lay in the shower and shiver back and forth, like think you know. about what we recorded, <laughs> <laughs> think yeah. about the things we've done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, it's overcoming like your uh, you need when you when you lose your motivation, you need your encouragement, you you, know, you need to get your your oomph back, kind of a thing. Um, so this is the, the the title, by the way, springs from the idea that we all have you know a quote unquote inner monkey, you know that little voice inside your head. You basically have a van inside your head, <laughs> your own little inner monkey. <laughs> yeah, I've not thought about that. Is that why you call me that? I'm the evil voice in the <laughs> well that would be mm. the case when we debate things on film that, that's true that's yeah. true so the podcast uh, looks at basically how uh, the, the influence of your inner monkey you know the voice that tells you to uh, you know skip the gym today or you know why not have that second donut you know that, that voice it tells you, you know, how to overcome my that my favourite thing ever what, the second donut or skipping <laughs> the gym both I mean, basically how to uh, get past that how to, solutions to how to try and control uh, you know your life deal with things how you know basically make the most of your goals right um, so there are episodes, for instance, of like handling regret, building encouragement, how to process, you know, how to how to skirt procrastination, yeah. as it were, which I struggle with quite a bit, I admit. And uh, you know that that kind of a, that kind of a thing sounds really useful. It is a bit, I think so. Um, you can check them out on all good podcast platforms, or like our show, you could just go to pod dot link and type in in a monkey into the search box. I did this this morning. Nice and easy. It gives you every platform you can find yeah. it on, but also gives you the official site for the show, and also gives you their Patreon as well if you want to get more involved and become like a supporter so that's in a monkey so a bit of a 
a mixed bag when it comes to what is in on the big screen. Um, the avoidance is obviously that blue hedgehog, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but if you're after something roll a little bit... Yeah, yeah, roll it out the way. <laughs> leave your rings behind. Um, yeah. But if you want to stay at home, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you're chilling this weekend, maybe you're not going out for Valentine's Day or anything like that, and you're thinking, what is good on the small screen... Mm. We've got, got something for you. I've got some belters for you, got you this week. you want to kick us oh, off? Oh, okay. Saturday night, Dave, 9 p.m. This is a movie. Man on Fire. Man on Fire. You must love this, surely. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was the movie that came out of nowhere and basically kind of invented what I what I refer to now as the Taken formula, which <laughs> is just take a dramatic actor who we don't really think of as, who's aged up a bit, we don't really think of as an action guy, and give him a proper nasty R-rated action vehicle. And Denzel started this all off in 2004 with Man on Fire, also showed us uh, Tony Scott's... Uh, his, what would become his uh, his ultimate his final wave mm. of films his uh, his final s- sense of style he would wound up applying this to things like Deja Vu Domino films like that and it is John Creasy bodyguard played by uh, Denzel Washington becomes bodyguard for a young girl in South America young girl of uh, an American for, um, American wife and uh, regional local regional uh, husband I think he's in local politics yeah. something like that um, when she is abducted he sets finds her. a very specific set of skills indeed <laughs> oh baby <laughs> she needed me so much yeah. sometimes I felt like I had nothing to give her. Just, uh, I don't know what to do. What are you gonna do? What I do best. I'm gonna kill him. Anyone I was involved, anybody who profited from it, anybody who opens their eyes at me. You're going to kill them all. You're going to kill them all. And it's awesome. Do you know what? This film came out in 2004. Mm. It has the feels of a 1995 movie in a very positive way. In a good way. I think that's Tony Scott's influence, clearly. uh, So that's that's worth checking out. Meanwhile, one I know you must must have loved when you were a kid. So I I do love Father of the Bride. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Mm. I've always wondered, and by the way, it's on the Sony channel at 2.20 p.m. on Sunday. Yeah. Um, Did it influence of the 90s, the... The Nicole Papa adverts. <laughs> was it Fiat or Renault? Was it Renault? Oh no, I don't think it, it was. But that, well, was or Citroen. The advert, but I don't think I'm that name was every the. Uh, I don't think that was the uh, the influence. I but didn't what it that feel like that? I always linked the two of them. Yeah, felt like it did. But yeah, Steve Martin, absolute classic. Um, this and I, I love the sequel as well. You know, Father of the Bride two that works really well. Funny you say that oh, because yeah. straight after Father of the Bride on the Sony Channel on Sunday afternoon. He's father of the bride, Oh, you get a double bill. Amazing. Let's see how it all started. What? I'm engaged. <laughs> I'm engaged. I'm getting married. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my, my. Oh, so, oh, my. And that's your engagement ring, huh? Yes, yes. We got it at a flea market outside of Rome. The guy we bought it from said it was at least 100 years old. Wow. So, Dad, stop it. Say something. I'm sorry. What did you say? Dad, I met a man in Rome, and he's wonderful and brilliant, and we're getting married. It's such a heartwarming film. It's it funny. Is. It's got everything to it. And again, I can't remember when this was out. I feel like it's 91. like 92. Oh, yeah, 91. 91. Yeah. There we go. It's of that time, but doesn't date. I still quote this movie every single time what do you I want. quote wanna, from it? I quote every time I want to make chili dogs and I'm in a supermarket. <laughs> I want to buy eight hot dogs and eight hot dog buns. But they don't sell eight hot dog buns. They only sell 12 hot dog buns. And the whole <laughs> rant. Uh, but yeah, so uh, meanwhile, move on to Monday. One of my favourite films of the last decade. Yes, and one of my favourite books actually really? I, yeah, yeah I read this on holiday and I loved it and uh, it's did gone did you look menacingly at your husband afterwards <laughs> no I was like can you stop distracting me I'm still reading <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Gone Girl film for nine o'clock done really well you oh, know yeah. actually there, there's a couple of twists and turns that aren't mm. in the book but most uh, Ros- Rosamund Pike's finest turn in years so I just to synopsize for anyone who hasn't read the book or seen the film this is Wife Goes Missing Husband gets accused of something. We're not quite sure what. Speaking of which, Amy's blood type. God, I don't know. I have to look it up at the house. You don't know if she has friends. You don't know what she does all day. And you don't know your wife's blood type. Sure, y'all are married. 
I, I, maybe it's a typo. Where are her folks? New York? Yeah. Can they get here in time for this press conference tomorrow? Tomorrow? I, I have no idea. I haven't talked to them. You haven't called your wife's parents I yet? I mean, you can't get a signal in this building. I've been in here talking to you. Well, call them, please, Nick, now. Hi. Should I know my wife's blood type? And of course, it's Affleck, which makes everything like five times better. Yeah, and yeah. And Rosamund Pike's so good. In She's it. so good yeah. in it. And do you know what I find really interesting is if anyone's on Netflix is watching The Stranger mm. at the moment. Oh, I keep hearing about it. Yeah. yeah, there's very good sort of similarities in that as well. So, look, if you are if you like that kind of thing, Gone Girl is a, is a brilliant kind of take on 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 that kind of yeah. on a, on a fantastic book actually. Proper so. ninety style R rated thriller, I think. Yeah. And for the adults. Thriller. So, uh, Tuesday, what you got for me? Oh, I thought you'd like You can't fight the moonlight. You can't fight the moonlight, baby. Uh, Coyote Ugly, ITV2, 8 o'clock. Uh, Pi Piper Parabo? I always call her Parabo, but I'm never sure how it's pronounced. Yeah, so her and Adam... Adam Garcia. Garcia. Who did a terrific cover of Night Fever in the late 90s when he was <laughs> on the West End production of yep. Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. Just so FYI, this, not that I know. This, this movie of a songwriter, not a singer, a mm -hmm. songwriter who moves to Brooklyn or wherever she is in New York um, to, to work, well, she ends up working in a bar, but she really wants her music to be found. I mean, it's every girl's dream. Kevin, what is your problem? Look, I'm sorry about tonight, but look at this, there was no... No way Lil was gonna let me out. This is not about Lil. This is about you and this place. This is my job. It's a goddamn sandbox for you to stick your head in. What is that supposed to mean? The place is a joke. All right? They don't come to watch you sing. They come to watch girls shaking it on a bar. And what would you have me do? Sing for quarters in the park? Well, at least you'd be singing your own songs. I told you I can't do that, so stop pushing. I'm just asking you to try. But I guess that's asking a bit too much. This is something I lived my life by. Is it? I loved this movie. You I, all I grew about up the big belts and the sparkly vests. Yeah, I mean, it sort of influenced my university <laughs> outfits, I think. Well, it's... I don't know about anyone else, but I'm trolling Bex's Facebook uh... profile later. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> um, no, the thing I loved about this is mm. that it captured a generation, which I think, you know, mm. we didn't have as many of these kind of movies out at the time. We didn't. It's what quite a... came during a lull, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really mm. did. And it, although, like, not a well known cast, you know, it, it still worked in a lot of good in a lot of ways so um and you know it spawned clubs and bars that people would <laughs> dance did. on the on the top yeah. saying hell no h2o and all that kind of stuff it just works so get definitely check it out so on to wednesday one of my personal favorite movies i don't think it's like one of the greatest movies ever but one of my yeah. favorite movies the butterfly effect is on sony at 9 p.m i can't remember if i've seen this this is ashton kutcher has gaps in his memory and blackouts that quickly are revealed to be effectively a sort of twisted form of time travel and timeline manipulation it's messed up it has about four different cuts out in the world and uh, well i'm not sure which version of this they're playing on the sony channel i could hazard a guess i don't think it's the one that ends with stop crying your heart out by oasis which is my favorite version but uh yeah it's ashton kutcher and it, ashton kutcher at his finest and this is the reason i have given him a free pass for 20 years <laughs> when he was your age Almost exactly, Rage, come to think of it. He said he figured out a way to remember his past. I couldn't tell if they were real memories or just his imagination. Then, just before it got so bad, he uh, had to be institutionalized. He said he could. What? 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 I don't know what can he do. Forget it. It's nothing. He was far too sick by then. Because otherwise, Ashton Kutcher is terrible, but this movie rocks. Let's go to Thursday, where we've got something I know you got to love. <laughs> That's a very bad Roy Orbison from me. Uh, Pretty Woman, Sony oh, Channel, yeah. a classic, 9 o'clock. Uh, Julia Roberts in her absolute breakout role, and then obviously Richard Gere as well, being the dashing man that he is. Uh, this is a rags to riches story. This is something that works really well, teaches a lot of life lessons. This is the movie we literally got the phrase, hooker with a heart of gold from. Yes, I don't know how often you use that phrase. It comes but... up in reviews and things okay. fairly often, All I would right. say. Okay, fine. Yeah, not in your everyday occurrence, though. Um, <laughs> we have very different lives, perfect. We do indeed, we do indeed. <laughs> no, I don't need to say a lot about this. It's an absolute classic. If you haven't seen it, what are you doing? If you have seen it, watch it again. It's and, brilliant. And I've got the greatest moment of the entire movie for you. Hey, I no, you. thank you. Hi. Hello. Do you remember me? No, I'm sorry. I was in here yesterday. You wouldn't wait on me? Oh. You work on commission, right? Uh, yes. 
Big mistake. Big. Huge. I have to go shopping now. Big mistake. Huge. Big huge. Mistake. Huge. 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 Yeah. So, uh, one to end the week with. Let's, uh, let's go thinker. Villeneuve. It's a thinker, yeah. Arrival, film four, nine o'clock. What happens if a big, giant spacecraft a appears in a field? You I'm try and talk to it. it, isn't it? Is it? Is it? Is there what? Because it's a multiple ones. I haven't seen the movie in a few years. Yeah, I think yeah, appears it appears over, around the world. So yeah. what do you do? You send Amy Adams in, of course. Well, linguist. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she is in. She's in. But she's indeed. Let's just say a clever linguist. Yeah. And uh, the, the whole speaks alien. Speak, <laughs> Well, that's the thing, isn't it? She has to learn to yeah. speak alien. And there's some so, some brilliant visuals in this. This is Roger Deakins on visuals, isn't it, for a Oscar rival? winning. Sorry, Oscar winner, Roger Deakins. Two-time Oscar winner. And, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's, let's prominently display some Oscar winners like Forrest Whitaker and, and, and yeah. Amy Adams. Everything you're doing here, I have to explain to a room full of men whose first and last question is how can this be used against us? Kangaroo. What is that? In 1770. Captain James Cook's ship ran aground off the coast of Australia and he led a party into the country and they met the Aboriginal people. One of the sailors pointed at the animals that hop around and put their babies in their pouch and he asked what they were and the Aborigines said kangaroo. It wasn't until later that they learned that kangaroo means I don't understand. I can show that for now. Yeah. And remember what happened to the Aborigines. A more advanced race nearly wiped them out. That story, by the way, about the kangaroo is not actually true. Like, okay. After the clip, thanks she does for, say thanks it's for, not. But yeah. Thanks for acknowledging that. <laughs> um, no, it's a great film. And actually, it's, it mm. takes a different spin yeah. on the idea of aliens. So if you haven't does, seen yeah. it, yeah. We're expecting a, a new Villeneuve film, aren't we? Dune. Well, part Dune. one of two. Part one of two. So that's I think, yeah, he's a very accomplished director. You definitely want to go and check that out. So that's nine o'clock, film four on Friday night. What a way to end the week. What a belter What a film. good week for... I'd almost just stay in. And we're going to keep it on the couch and keep it on home platforms. So, Miss Perfect, let's uh, should we see what's hitting the VOD, the DVD, the BR? Everything. Everything. Ah, oh, I just said to you, just yeah. off air just now, yeah. I was like, have we seen this? Oh, and then I went, oh. Yeah. Yeah, we have. <laughs> okay, so well, you might be wondering what we're talking about. We're talking about Gemini Man, Will Smith. Were you not won over by this, I, I said. It's an Ang Lee film. Yeah. You should know better. Um, well, true, yeah. And it was filmed in a high frame rate. Oh, God, yes. I've this is the problem it. with it. I didn't yeah. mind the story or anything like that. We got to see it. It's 48 frames per second. 60. 60 frames, 60 frames per second. A second. Okay. Yeah. And I, the only other film that I've seen like this is, is I think it was at 48, was The Hobbit. Oh, no, no. Hang on. I might be wrong. It was, I think, 120 frames a second. It was 60 frames in each eye oh, because it was right. in 3D. So it looked literally twice as mental as it needed to. It was insane. It was a hard. It wasn't watch. insane. It was. Uh, it. Do you know what I really don't like about this uh, ultra realism? Mm. Is it feels like you're watching a rehearsal. It does a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's really distracting. And yeah. I'm hoping that it hasn't translated in this format to small screen. Well, I have got it on home platform to watch, so I'm, I'm assuming You'll have it to comes clarify in, that I'm assuming us. it just comes in standard 24 or 30 frames. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, to be honest, I mean, the concept's not the bad. The concept's fine. The concept's good. Will Smith nothing... is world's greatest assassin, fights his own younger clone. Yeah, it's nothing mm. groundbreaking. It's yeah. just, yeah, it's just, it, if it wasn't so distracting from the way it was shot for cinema, yeah. then I think it would have had a better run at it on the big screen. I think the film itself is quite average as well, though. And I think because we've but got people so don't mind that. that. Well, yeah. People don't mind that. It's a throwaway. It's There's a throwaway some, action movie. Some good action, though. And actually, I, some of the technology that I did mm. like was the de-aging yeah. of Will Smith. I think that worked really well. Exactly. For all the effort that went into that de-aging, it seems criminal to then hide it behind this awful frame rate. Yeah. Yeah, that totally didn't mm. work for me. And I, I think I'd like to see it again. Yeah in this respect if it is just on your home platform and it might f flourish a bit more it's been a while from a cinema yeah. to home platform i'd forgotten about the film that's well, yeah. how long it's been i feel like it's been over a year it feels Probably like hasn't. that but, uh, no put it this way I, i'd moved south so it has to be after was it like november do you know what what we're doing here is we're giving you examples of why it's so forgettable <laughs> yeah, exactly that's because we doing. can't even remember when it was out right, so that's is, gemini man hmm. Is, Ma is Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, any more memorable? Yes, I actually really enjoyed this. I didn't mind it, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. I really liked it. I like. Well, I was a bit nervous about some of the ending and the sort of th things that they did in the um, yeah. 
in the cathedral. Oh yeah, that that has that's Some all the makings conno- are really horrible. But then the again, connotations of that was not great. But then again, the first movie has that sort of you know rape scene moment. Yeah, it's a bit boundary pushing. But yeah. look, I think you know who else would ever play Maleficent than Angelina Jolie? She's brilliant <laughs> in it. Um, Elle Fanning is great um, as her goddaughter, stepdaughter. Uh, uh, one God of the two. But it, but it all about the five man. All about the five. Yes. So, yeah, but Michelle Pfeiffer in this is brilliant mm-hmm. as yeah. like the evil step. No, she's the evil stepmother. Is that right? Step- no, she's the mother of, uh, mother-in-law oh, mother to of be. Mother mother-in-law to, to be. be. Yeah. Oh, it's all a bit confusing because it's all so fairies. The idea and, is, and yeah, that's the idea is Sleeping Beauty, Elle Fanning, Aurora. I think her name Aurora, is. Aurora. Yeah. She's now going to marry her Prince Charming. Yes. They go. They meet. They do the meet the parents thing, but it turns out that they are genocidal, anti fairy tale creature monsters. Put lightly, yeah. Yeah, who are trying to harvest the, the powers of the forest. i tell you what, let's have a sample of Angelina getting to face off against Michelle Pfeiffer, which really does feel like the 80s versus the 90s. I remember the story of a baby. A baby cursed to sleep and never wake up. Really? Who would do such a terrible thing to an innocent child? Well, there are many who pray on the innocent. I'm sure your kind would agree. What do you mean, my kind? She means humans. There are fairies missing from the moors. What I'm missing is some wine. Stolen by human poachers. That's the first I've heard of it. Someone gave the order. 90s versus 2000s probably a better way to yeah, phrase that. I I think. Think yeah, I think so. Um, Jesus. Yeah, she's so 90s. Do you know what? I, I did really enjoy this film more than I thought I would. I thought the, the relationship between Elle Fanning's character, Aurora, and Maleficent was really nice. It did work. I liked uh, Chewy Tell for joining the cast yeah. as well as a sort of leader of what were the, what were the her race are called. Because it introduced like an origin story of Maleficent. In yeah, so you learn a lot more mm. about her and how she came to be and, and who she is as mm. a character and actually that she's not all bad. She's got a bit of a heart to her as well. Yeah, it works, doesn't it? And it doesn't feel too... Too forced. No, and it wasn't anything groundbreaking. Like, don't get us wrong, but if you enjoyed the first Maleficent movie, you'll definitely enjoy this as a sequel. Yeah, and I didn't enjoy the first Maleficent movie and still enjoyed this. Well, there we go. Then it's probably even better. (laughs) One I did enjoy. We're going over to Netflix now. We're going to streaming. One movie I did really enjoy, and I feel like this did not get it to do. And this was the live-action adaptation by Spielberg of the BFG. Yes, I really enjoyed Mm. this. And in fact, I have to say, when it came out and they did the big premiere, they put this massive thing up in Leicester Square. You could go and sit in a giant chair and stuff. It was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, snots covers everywhere. And this is Mark Um, Rylance as the BFG. Spielberg directing, you've got a hell of a cast in there. Who played, was it Penelope Penelope Winton who played the Queen in this film? Oh, yeah, I think it was. Um, And and people like Jermaine Clement and Jason Fleming as the other giants. I think it just did. And I think the BFG and Roald Dahl will mm. capture. I think when we've got too much stuff out there available yeah. for kids, you know, back in our day, <laughs> back in our day, back in our day, all we had was like Roald Dahl and a few choice, you know, well, exactly, Enid yeah. Blyton and things like that. And actually, now the, the, the downfall of it is that it probably didn't get seen because, like, you know, they've got too much choice. Well, that's the thing. This is now going to reach Netflix. This is Saturday, 15th of February. Uh, perfect post Valentine's Day hangover cure right there with Roald Dahl Giant. It's good for action. adults, isn't it? Good for adults. I loved it. Yeah. I, it's full of snoz cumbers and whiz bangers and fizz poppers. Fun. I think with it being on Netflix, hopefully it might now find more of an audience it might get out there a bit more because I know that the animated one did the same on Amazon Prime oh did that it that found a lot wider an audience on Amazon one. Prime yeah. so I'm hoping that this did the same with a live action one on Netflix so let's uh, have a look at next week what have we got next week so we've got the Tiffany Haddish film um, oh like a boss like a boss it's got Rose Byrne in it mm-hmm. and who else is in uh, it Rose Byrne Pena, uh, not Pena, Salma, no, Hayek. Salma Hayek Salma yeah. Hayek so that's that movie that's out. Penelope Cruz then. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Because on the poster, she kind of looks like, because she's kind of disguised under a weirdly coloured hair and big glasses. Yeah. I just thought it was Penelope Cruz. We've uh-huh. also got uh, The Call of the Wild next week okay. with the Sir Harrison Ford. Uh, the End <laughs> of the Century, uh, with the new Peccadillo flick. And we've got the documentary Midnight Family. But most importantly, a movie I have seen and I cannot wait to talk to you about okay. is Michael Winterbottom's latest collaboration yes. with Steve Coogan 
It's greed. greed. Have you seen? No, I'm going to see. You're seeing Monday morning. Yeah. I, I will see you. Uh, I will see you afterwards. It just. I, I can't wait to compare notes with you. Yeah. I really I'm can't. doing the double bill of like a boss and greed, um, <laughs> and I'm not sure how I'm going to take it. <laughs> there's a we, there's a weird uh, yeah, a weird really lineup sure. there actually. That kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, I'm uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. So that should be an interesting week for films. This week has been a bit of a mixed bag, I'd have to say. I think it has been. Yeah. You know, it, it depends what you really like. If you if you're that big a Sonic fan, you're going to go and watch that movie anyway mm. if you like a good period drama emma is definitely there for you and you know the public sounds really interesting i just don't think it's going to get the the access and and viewing that it probably deserves and that's about then uh, all we have time for for this week so uh, well i've been van connor and i've been bex perfect and this has been off screen your seven day guide to everything movies do join us again next week we'll be bringing you back much much more <laughs> <laughs>